In this video, we will introduce convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks are designed for image data. These networks were one of the earliest success stories in the neural network domain. These networks also brought a lot of attention to deep learning because of their successes in image classification competition. Uh, convolutional neural networks are designed with an eye on the spatial structure of image data. This idea of creating neural networks which are sensitive to the domain at hand has been the successful recipe for many domains such as, for example, uh, speech data for which we use recurrent neural networks as well as for image data for which we use convolutional neural networks. They tell us a story that it's very important to design neural networks with an idea about the structure of the data domain at hand. Like recurrent neural networks, convolutional neural networks are domain-aware neural networks. What this means is that the structure of the neural network is designed for a very specific domain. In the case of recurrent neural networks, the structure of the neural network is specifically designed for sequence data. In the case of the convolutional neural network, the structure of the network is specifically designed for images. The layers also have a structure which match the specific structure of images. Images have a certain type of structure in which there's a length, there's a width, and there's a depth corresponding to the number of color channels. So for example, typically uh, an input image would have three color channels corresponding to red, green, and blue color maps. In the, in the case of a convolutional neural networks, all layers, including the input layer, are spatially structured in a similar way with length, width, and depth. Convolutional neural networks are one of the networks which were motivated by study of neuroscience. In particular, they were motivated by Hubel and Wiesel's understanding of the cat's visual cortex. Some of the salient observations from that study of Hubel and Wiesel was that particular shapes in the visual fields they excite neurons. And this also corresponds to a sparse connectivity in which small regions of the neural field can excite neurons. So similarly, in a convolutional neural network, you have sparse connectivity corresponding to small portions of the visual field. And there is shared weights so that on all parts of the visual field, the same weights are used in order to extract the same type of shapes. Similarly, in biological networks, there is often a hierarchical arrangement of neurons into simple and complex cells. This also came from Hubel's and Wiesel's understanding of the cat's visual cortex. And just as in the case of the visual cortex, in the convolutional neural network, you have the hierarchical arrangement of neurons, which of course is true for most types of neural networks. So the first variant of convolutional neural networks was the neocognitron which motivated uh, LANET-5. Now, uh, this basic structure of the convolutional neural network has not changed much since LANET-5 was proposed. There have been some advances in training, but the main difference is that the amounts of data that are now available for training have become very large. And this has led to a huge success in image classification competitions. So a particular competition which is very well known in the, in the vision community is the ImageNet co uh, competition in which deep learning methods and specifically convolutional neural networks have been consistent winners. And this, these victories of uh, deep learning methods in ImageNet competitions have brought great attention to this broader area. So let's talk about the basic structure of a convolutional neural network. Most layers in a convolutional neural network are spatially structured. As you'll see, some of the final layers are not spatially structured. They are called fully connected layers. But most layers, they are spatially structured and they have a length, width, and depth. This is inherited from the image itself, which is spatially structured. In most cases, the input images as well as the intermediate layers are square. What that means is that the length and width are almost always the same. However, the depth may vary for different layers. In the particular case of the input layer, the depth of the input is often three for color images. 
and it's one for grayscale. However, for hidden layers, typically the depth is arbitrary. In fact, in most hidden layers, the depth may run in the hundreds. Now, uh, there are three basic operations which are used in the spatial layers. These three operations are convolution, max pooling, and ReLU. In fact, a convolutional neural network is defined as a neural network which performs a convolutional operation in at least one layer. The other point is that the max pooling has been substituted with strided co convolution in recent years. And the convolution uh, operation, as you see, it is analogous to a matrix multiplication in a conventional network. So uh, a convolution neural network uses a filter. Now, a filter is analogous to your weight matrix in a traditional neural network. So just as a traditional neural network uses a weight matrix to transform one layer to the next, the features in one layer to the next, a convolutional neural network uses a filter, which is again, just as the layers are three-dimensional, the filters is three-dimensional. So let's say that a particular input volume has dimensions LQ, which is the length, cross BQ, which is the breadth. Typically, LQ and BQ are the same uh, in most cases, as we discussed in the previous slide, and DQ, which is the depth. Now, in the case of input layers, DQ is typically three. Uh, for example, if you have red, green, blue colors, and if it's grayscale, DQ is one. However, in hidden layers, the value of DQ can be arbitrary. Now, in any given layer, you use a filter of size FQ cross FQ cross DQ. Now, note that this FQ is typically much smaller than both LQ and BQ. So, it's a small square filter, which corresponds to a small square region of the visual field. The other point that you note is that the depth of the filter, that's DQ, it is the same value between the input volume as well as the filter. So, uh, so the filter's uh, filter's depth must match that of the input volume for a convolutional operation to occur. And, and typically, the value of FQ uh, is a small odd number like 3 or 5. And in recent years, uh, there has been an increasing trend toward using filters of size 3. And uh, as you see in some later lectures, there are some special applications where it's actually possible to have a uh, filters in which FQ has a value of 1. Uh, now, uh, how does a convolution operation occur? Now, as we noticed in the previous slide, the filter is typically much smaller than the input volume. So, you can, you, you can align the filter at various places along the spatial volume. So let's look at this. So, so we spatially align the top left corner of the filter with each of LQ minus FQ plus 1 cross BQ minus FQ plus 1 spatial position. Now, how did I get this number? Note that uh, your input layer has size LQ cross BQ cross DQ. So there are LQ minus FQ plus 1 cross BQ minus FQ plus 1 spatial positions at which you can align the filter so that the filter fully fits inside the layer volume. So, uh, because remember, the depth of the filter is the same, so there will be a spatial region uh, with a matching depth in which the entire 3D volume of the filter overlaps with a portion of the input volume, with a small portion of the input volume. And there will be a total of FQ cross FQ cross DQ aligned elements, which is the size of your filter. So there will be as many aligned elements as the size of your filter. And what we will do is that we will perform an element-wise multiplication. So there are FQ cross FQ cross DQ aligned elements, one for each element of the filter between the input volume as well as the filter. And you will multiply each of these aligned volume and you'll add up these FQ cross FQ cross DQ elements. Now, this is basically equivalent to treating your entire filter as a vector of size FQ cross FQ cross DQ and also treating the aligned portion of the input volume as a vector of the same size and performing a dot product between these two vectors. And when you do this, because you are doing this over all LQ minus FQ plus 1 cross BQ minus FQ plus 1 spatial positions, you are going to create an output spatial map, a single output spatial map 
ऑफ साइज एल क्यू माइनस एफ क्यू प्लस वन क्रॉस बी क्यू माइनस एफ क्यू प्लस वन नाउ आई डिस्कस अर्लियर दैट द हिडन लेयर विल हैव मल्टीपल स्पेशल मैप सो हाउ डू यू गेट दीज मल्टीपल स्पेशल मैप्स द रीजन इज दैट यू डोंट जस्ट यूज वन फिल्टर यू यूज मल्टीपल फिल्टर इन ऑर्डर टू क्रिएट डेप्थ इन आउटपुट वॉल्यूम नाउ नोट दैट द मोर द नंबर ऑफ फिल्टर दैट यू यूज द हायर द कैपेसिटी ऑफ योर मॉडल so typically if you want to increase the capacity of your learning model you are going to use a larger number of filters because you are going to cap uh, catch a, a larger number of features in your input volume so let's look at uh, some examples so here i have shown some examples of input and output dimensions so let's say that you have uh, you perform the convolution on the input layer now the input layer will typically have depth of 3 uh, so here you can see the input volume is of size 32 cross 32 cross 3 which in this particular case let's just assume that it's red green and blue colors and note that your filter is of much smaller size than your input volume it's of size 5 cross 5 cross 3 now this 3 that's not a coincidence the depth of the input and the filter must match so the number of possible places at which you can align this filter with the input volume is 32 minus 5 plus 1 multiplied by 32 minus 5 plus 1 so there are 28 cross 28 spatial positions in the input volume where the filter fully fits inside the input volume at each of these positions you are going to perform element wise multiplication between each of the 75 elements of filter now there note that the filter is 5 cross 5 cross 3 so 5 multiplied by 5 is 25 multiplied by 3 that's 75 elements so you are going to perform an element wise multiplication between the 75 elements of filter and the 75 aligned elements of your input volume and then you're going to add up these 75 values to create a single output value now you're going to do this for all 28 cross 28 aligned position so you'll create a single output map of size 28 cross 28 with this filter but here you see that the output volume is of depth 5 how did we get depth 5 the reason we got depth 5 is because you will have multiple filters to catch multiple types of features So, for example, let's look at an example which is on the right-hand side. So here, I have a filter which uh, is what you call a horizontal edge detector. So I haven't yet discussed why this is a horizontal edge edge detector, but this particular pattern of ones and zeros you see in the filter, this detects particular types of horizontal edges. Now uh, it also perform uh, will give some activation for slanted edges, but for vertical edges it will give zero activation. so this particular filter what you'll do is you'll slide it all over the input volume so here i have given an example of how you're sliding the filter so here you see a, an example of an input image with a rectangle inside it so whenever the filter is overlapping with a, a horizontal edge or even a, an edge with some horizontal component it's going to give an activation Uh, on the other hand if it's overlapping with a portion containing a vertical edge it's going to get zero activation so this is the idea you're trying by sliding the filter all over the image you're trying to find a particular type of feature you're trying to de detect a particular type of edge in the image now in this particular case i have only shown one input map but typically you will uh, your filter uh, for example if it's an input volume you will have a depth of 3 and the filter will be sliding uh, the filter will also have a depth of 3 and it will slide be doing the same thing for all colors now in this particular case i just gave a very neat type of example just to illustrate in reality the filters are not quite as simple and clean as this <clears throat> now uh, let's look at an example of a convolutional operation so here i am going to use a depth of 1 uh, for simplicity so your uh, input spatial volume has a depth of 1 so it's easy to show uh, with a 2d structure the filter also has a depth of 1 because the filter depth must always match the input depth so here uh, you have a 3 cross 3 uh, filter and your uh, input volume is of size 7 cross 7 so obviously now if you slide this filter at every possible position at which the filter 
uh, uh, is fully overlaps with the image. That means the filter is fully covered by the image. You are going to get five cross five positions. So you are going to get uh, an output spatial map of size five cross five. Now note that if you use multiple filters, even though your input is one dimensional, it is only one feature map. You can get a depth of uh, you, you 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 can get a depth greater than one. So, for example, if you use five filters, you'll get a depth of five in the output. But here, I'm showing only one filter. So, let's see how we create the lower left uh, value of the output, which is 16 in this example. So, what you do, you're sliding this filter. So, you slide the filter in the lower left corner, three cross three grid in the lower cross left corner, and you perform element wise multiplication between the filter elements and the matching input elements. So, here you'll get five times one plus one times one plus eight times one uh, plus one times two. So, you're going to get five plus one, six plus eight, 14 plus two, 16. So, so, so that's how you get uh, the 16 in the lower left corner. And similarly, you can, uh, when, when you slide this filter at this other element, uh, at, at this other highlighted three cross three grid I've shown, you, you perform the same convolution operation, you get an output of 26. Now, you can do this for each of the matching Five, at five cross five positions, so so uh, so that the filter is fully covered by the input volume, and you get the output volume shown shown on the far right. Now here, of course, I have shown it only for a depth of one. Uh, if you have a depth greater than one, then uh, you will have to add up these multiplications over the multiple activation maps. Now. Uh, here, uh, what you have to understand about convolution is that this is essentially your weight matrix. There's a sparse connectivity because we are creating a filter from a region uh, in the input volume of the size of filter. So what we're trying to do is, is that we are trying to look for features in small regions of the image. And uh, there are shared weights because we are trying, we, we, we use, we slide the same filter across the entire spatial volume and the reason you are doing this so if you go back to the example over here uh, or the example on the right you're trying to find a horizontal edge in this case everywhere in the image so because you uh, you want to interpret the same shape everywhere in the image you slide the same filter everywhere in the image so so that way you'll get a high activation in this particular case on the right you'll get a high activation whenever you detect for example a horizontal edge somewhere so uh, <clears throat> So the so uh, so so in this case the primary effect of convolution is that each feature in a hidden layer it captures some properties of a region of the input image, and a convolution uh, in the qth layer increases the receptive field of a feature from the qth layer to the q plus one layer. So what what do I mean by receptive field? Receptive field means that a particular feature in a particular layer what what part of the input image is it responding to? So for example, if you use a three cross three filter in three layers, then an activation in the first layer will be capturing a pixel region of three cross three in the original input image. But then the second layer, because it's capturing a larger part of the second layer, uh, but but uh, but but uh, sorry the the second hidden layer because it's capturing uh, a larger part of the first hidden layer you are going to cap capture a larger region of the original input image so you're going to get capture a region of size 5 cross 5 in the original input image and similarly uh, the, uh, the the third uh, hidden layer is going to capture uh, an input region of size 7 cross 7 so, so in this way, you capture larger and larger regions of the input image by using activation in successive layers. Now, one point is that the convolution operation reduces the size of the Q plus 1th layer in comparison with the size of the Qth layer. So, for example, if you look at this example of convolution, the input was a size 7 cross 7, but after you convolve, it became a size 5 cross 5. Similarly, in this example, on the left, you had an input of spatial uh, size 32 cross 32, but when you convert, you got an output of size 28 cross 28. So you don't really want to do this 
and one of the other problems is that it also tends to lose some information along the borders of the image uh, uh, when you're doing this uh, uh, this type of operation and this problem can be resolved by using padding so in particular if you use fq minus 1 where fq is the size of the filter fq minus 1 divided by 2 pixels all around the border of the feature map you can maintain the size of the spatial image and typically you pad them with zeros so here uh, i've shown an example where you pad with two zeros all around the borders now in this case if you had a filter of size 5 cross 5 and you perform the convolution on the padded uh, image, you are going to get an output map of the same size, of the same size of original image. So in the, in the original case, it's 7 cross 7, but then you pad it with two zeros on either side. And after you perform the convolution, so here, for example, when we perform the convolution, uh, our output map was of size 5 cross 5. But after we pad it and we perform the same convolution in this case, after we pad it with two zeros on all sides and perform the same uh, convolution, uh, but, but you perform it with a filter of size 5 cross 5, uh, not with a filter of size uh, 3 cross 3. You are going to get uh, uh, an output a map whose size is maintained. Now, uh, there are several types of padding depending on whether you want to uh, reduce your size of your input image or whether you want to uh, increase your size fr from the input to the output. So, when no padding is used, it reduces the size of the spatial footprint by FQ-1. We already saw that in several examples. Half padding is what we just discussed. When you pad with FQ-1 divided by 2 pixels, it maintains the size of the spatial footprint. Final is full padding. When you want to increase the size, that's when you when you pad with FQ minus one pixel. This increases the sp uh, spatial foot footprint with FQ minus one. And in fact, uh, you can get this neat formula where it's two times the amount padded plus the size reduction. Now note that the size reduction will be negative if the size is, is increasing from the input to the output will be equal to FQ minus 1. The reason you get this factor of 2 is because you are padding this amount on both sides of the image. So for example, if you look at the example over here, you are padding on both sides. Uh, so uh, we did notice that uh, convolutions can either slightly increase or slightly decrease uh, the size of your input image to the output. Now, in many cases, you want to be a bit more aggressive. Uh, the way in which one can uh, reduce the spatial footprints very aggressively by, use, by factors of, say, 2 or factors of 3 is by using strides. So when you use a stride of SQ, let's say you uh, you use a stride of 2. In this case, you will perform a convolution at locations 1, 3, 5. So, 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 so you will align it at odd positions. So let's look at a specific example uh, here. Uh, so let's go back to that. So here, in, in this particular case, so if you use a stride of 3, What's going to happen is that if you use a stride of 3, your output will no longer be of size 5 cross 5. Your output will be of size 3 cross 3. Because the top left of the filter is going to align with, with, with the 6. That's the top left of the input image. Then when you move down, you'll move down by 2. So, so the next time it's going, the top left of the filter will align with the 7. And then you'll again move down by 2, it will align with the 5. So you get three possible positions. The same along the breadth, you get three possible positions. So your, so your output filter will be, will be a size 3 cross 3. So you can see that the size reduction is more drastic in this particular case. So uh, here you can see that the spatial size of the output on performing this convolution has height of LQ minus FQ divided by SQ. Now note that this division by SQ, to, for example, if SQ is 2, this is very aggressive uh, reduction in the size. And uh, in this case, exact divis divisibility is typically required in order to define this operation exactly. Otherwise, you'll have to do some padding. Now, uh, strided convolutions in recent years, they have uh, started replacing the max pooling operation. So let's talk about the max pooling operation. Max pooling operation also serves a similar purpose as strided convolution in terms of reducing the output 
uh, footprint, from the spatial size or input to the output. And but it works somewhat differently. Uh, it works on small grid regions of size PQ cross PQ in each layer, and it produces another layer with the same depth. Now, typical values of PQ, for example, it's very common to use PQ is equal to two. So typically it will be two cross two. And for each square region of size PQ cross PQ in each of the activation maps. Now note that the pooling is performed for each activation map. So for example, if you know in, in your input volume, you have a red map, a green map and a blue map, you will perform a pooling operation first for the red map, then you'll perform a separate pooling operation for the green map, then for the blue map. So again, when you when you do the outputs, you'll get a red map, a green map and a blue map. Now typically you don't apply the max pooling directly on the input volume, but I'm giving you this example just for illustration that you do it map by map. Now, uh, typically one uses strides in this case. So, uh, so and it's very common to use a stride so, so that PQ is equal to SQ. So, for example, if you're, if you're using a pool of size 2 cross 2 and use strides of 2, typically you'll have non-overlapping -overla regions in the image and you'll be pooling over the non-overlapping region. But, but it's not necessary. In certain well-known convolutional neural networks, uh, one uses uh, uh, overlapping uh, pools. Now, uh, now, 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 pooling drastically reduces the spatial dimensions of each output map. Now, now let's look at an example. Uh, here, I have given a pooling example with a stride of one. Now, stride of one is very uncommon, but I'm just showing it for illustration. So here, you can see the lower left example where, uh, where I've done three cross three pooling at stride of one, I get eight as the output. How do I get eight at, at, as the output? If you look at the lower left corner, the set of grid elements, the largest element is eight. Similarly, if you look at the lower right, you get seven as output. Uh, in this case, you can look at the highlighted region. You can see seven is the largest element in that highlighted region of size three cross three. In fact, if you do this entire pooling, uh, I leave it as an exercise for you to work out uh, how you get this particular output. Now, when you use a stride of two, you'll notice that you get a much smaller output. You, you get an output of size uh, three, uh, three cross three. <clears throat> now, uh, just as in any neural network, you use activation function. Now, activation functions are used in a very similar way as in conventional neural networks. They don't change the shape of the layer in any way. So the length, breadth, and the depth of the layer remains unchanged because it's a straightforward one-to-one -one operation. So in the case of the ReLU, uh, you just uh, set the value of that element to zero if it's negative. Otherwise, you just copy it. So the so number of feature maps in the spatial footprints uh, is retained. And often, if, when you look at architectural diagrams, it's often stuck at the end of convolutional operations. It's often not explicitly shown in architectural diagrams. Now, uh, in uh, finally, towards the end of the neural network, you have what is called fully connected layers. Now, fully connected layers are ex exactly like traditional neural networks. So, so, uh, so they're structured like exactly like traditional neural network in which there's no spatial relationships among the features. So each feature in the final spatial layer is connected to each hidden state in the first fully connected layers. And this layer functions in exactly the same way as a traditional feed forward network. And typically, one might use more than one fully connected layers uh, to increase the power of computations towards the end. And one very important point is that the vast majority of parameters uh, lie in these fully connected layers. And the nature of these fully connected layers, often they're also application specific. So sometimes in some applications, one tends to use uh, other types of approaches. Uh, in order to structure them. One doesn't always connect a, every uh, spatial element to, 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 to every uh, element in the first fully connected layer. So there are some variations, especially in recent years, in terms of how this fully connected layers are structured. And there's also some application specific property to these types of layers, how you exactly structure them. Now, uh, and of course, the fully connected layer is typically followed by a final output layer, which is also appli application specific. So, for example, if in ImageNet, if you are trying to classify one of uh, an image into one of 1000 categories, what you will have is a softmax layer at the very end. 
Now, uh, typically there is an interleaving between the layers. The, the convolutional pooling and the ReLU layer, they're typically interleaved in order to increase the expressive power. And the ReLU layers, often they follow the convolutional uh, layers, and that's very similar to traditional neural network in which the activation function immediately follows matrix multiplication. Because the convolution operation is the analog of matrix multiplication in traditional neural networks. And uh, after, typically what you'll do is that after two or three sets of convolutional ReLU combinations, one might have a max pooling layer. So here I've shown some examples, C, uh, CR, CRP, where C is for convolution, R is for ReLU, and P is for pooling. Now in recent years, uh, one has tended to substitute the max pooling operation with other types of operations, for example, like strided convolution. Now here, uh, I show an example of one of the first convolutional neural networks. Now, one of the amazing things is that when you look at this first convolutional neural network, if you look at modern neural networks, they aren't really very different from uh, this first convolutional neural net network. The main difference is in terms of, uh, first of all, ReLUs were never used. Uh, so if you look at... Uh, in, in the case of LANET5, which was the first convolutional neural network, they were using traditional activation functions. Uh, and here uh, you can see the input is a grayscale feature map of pixels. And this was actually used for handwriting recognition in bank checks. So typically a grayscale image uh, suffice. So you can see uh, in the first layer, you perform a convolution operation uh, in the f uh, first and third layers. Now, uh, if you look at the second layer, that's uh, it's written subsampling operation. Now, subsampling was really like max pooling, except that they didn't use max pooling. They used average pooling. So what they did is that they took the average of the elements. So in this case, you have a two cross two grid. So you have four elements and you took the average of four elements in the, in, in the grid. And uh, another thing that they did is that they scaled with a trainable weight and they added a bias. So these were trainable parameters. Now, in recent years, you don't do that. So there were these types of minor differences uh, were there. And then uh, the final uh, uh, operation, it was, uh, again, the C5 really was a convolution operation but really what was happening here is the size of your filter match the input so really this convolution operation became more like a fully connected layer uh, this final c5 layer and then you have an output layer which was a soft max so the output contained 10 possibilities the, the reason it contained 10 possibilities is because it was trying to recognize digits so the digits are from 0 to 9 so there are 10 possibilities, so your 10-way softmax output. And, and there were some other differences too in terms of how RBF units were used in terms of defining the objective function. Those, uh, so there were these, some of these minor differences, they are not used anywhere. But otherwise, if you look at LANET 5, the basic structure of the neural network is very similar to modern neural net networks, except that modern neural networks, they are far deeper. They have many more layers and you use them with far more data, which is what explains their success. Now, uh, the other point that I want to mention is that here uh, I've shown the full notation. So the subsampling, which in this case uh, is a really a max pooling operation, uh, analogous to a max pooling operation, they have been shown as separate layers. But if you look at modern architecture diagrams, typically they will not show the max pooling separately or the subsampling operation separately. They'll just show the convolution operation. So typically you'll see an architecture diagram which is kind of shortened. And typically you can see the SS I've just put a notation over there uh, where the subsign of max pooling are, sh are shown implicitly as SS or, or MP. So, uh, and the reason for this is that because modern architecture diagrams are very deep, so often you will not even have the page space to show uh, all these different layers. So often they only show the important layers and often show some of the other layers in shorthand. Now, uh, one very interesting point about convolutional neural networks is that they perform hierarchical feature engineering. So in hierarchical feature engineering, the idea is that the earlier layers, they detect primitive features, and the later layers, then they put together these features in, in order to define complex ones. So for example, here you see an input image of a rectangle, and you have two types of filter. One is a horizontal edge detector, and other is a vertical edge detector. 
So what so what's going to happen is that the output, the hidden layer will have two different feature maps. One will be better at detecting the horizontal edges, another will be better at detecting vertical edges. And the next layer filter, what it's going to do is going to take them together, it's going to detect the full rectangle. So this is what happens in convolutional neural network where hierarchical feature engineering is used in order to identify more complex features from simpler features in earlier layers. And in fact, it is this type of hierarchical feature engineering which explains the success of convolutional neural networks. In fact, they can often detect very semantically interpretable features. And in a later le uh, lecture, we will show you some examples of such visualizations. Now, uh, it's, just to give you an example, these successive uh, layers, they put together these primitive features to create more complex features. For, so, for example, these, uh, in, in the early layers, you might just detect edges, and the mid-level feature might be something like honeycomb, and the higher-level features might be a part of, the, uh, of a face. So, the idea is that the network really becomes a master at detecting these common uh, characteristics, this, these repeating characteristics and abstracting it out, these repeating shape in a uh, shapes in a data-driven manner. So depending on what type of data you have, so if you have a database of human faces, then it will extract features which are specific to human faces. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a database of trucks, it will extract features which are specific to trucks. So in the next uh, lecture, we will discuss backpropagation in convolutional neural networks and, it, and we'll discuss some visualization applications. So these uh, visualization applications, they will help you understand some aspects of the hierarchical feature engineering, which we have discussed in this lecture.